Hello, I'm Susan Cole. And I'm Matthew Hodson. And welcome to AIDS Map Chat, a live broadcast bringing you news about HIV for people all around the globe. Yes, it's the first episode of season five. Can you believe it? And we have a brilliant lineup of guests uh, here with us this evening. We've got uh, youth HIV activist Joyce Yuuma from Kenya. We have acclaimed writer Juno Roche, and we have a Ukrainian infectious disease specialist, Dr. Tatiana Kirichenko. Wonderful. I'm so excited to hear from all of our guests. But it has been ages since we've last been on. And so what have you been up to, Matthew? Uh, well, um, among other things. So um, I, I had an operation, I had surgery on my on my knee for a problem I had for a while. And <laughs> well, so the surgery was on the 29th of November. And I mean, when I got the appointment, I was like, oh, I don't know if I can do this because because it's like two days before World AIDS Day. And World AIDS Day has been like a big thing that I've been a part of for, you know, 25 years. I've been involved in doing something. And I thought, can I take the day off? And I was like, no, this, I've been waiting for this, this appointment for, 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 for months and months and months. And I just need to accept it the first possible opportunity. So I, I had the surgery and, um, you know, you get all up on the morphine. So I came out from underneath the anesthetic and, and, you know, and I thought I was just being incredibly witty and charming and all the nurses had adored me. Um, and then, you know, kind of go home and like, you know, taking the painkillers and stuff like that. And World AIDS Day comes along and I wake up in the morning and all these new data reports are out. And I'm like, oh, I'm lying in bed. I'm like, oh, I can just like tweet kind of comments about it. You know, we're doing well in the UK and this is a good thing and all of that sort of stuff. And then I get a call from um, a national broadcasting channel um, and they said, oh, will you do an interview with us? And I'm like, I'm feeling fine. Yeah, of course, I'll, I'll do an interview as well. They say this is really important. And then, you know, just well, uh, two hours later, my pain meds start wearing off and I'm suddenly in excruciating agony and I'm like, oh, I can't take the pain meds again because I really don't want to appear on the news completely high. Um, and so I like spent the whole day kind of like rocking back and forth and going, oh no, I can't take the pain meds, crying from the agony that I was in, appeared on this news programme and I was looking like hell, just like completely haggard and blotchy and drawn. <laughs> I got through it, you know, but I think the thing was, I think it's almost like for people who are living openly with HIV, we feel like we have to work harder, we have to do, push ourselves further because we can't be seen to be being weak. Um, and I think I learned a valuable lesson. It's like, it's okay to say no to things and it's okay to take time off if you need your body to recover. Um, and I think as people who live with HIV, we just sometimes need to be kind to ourselves. Absolutely. That's a very good point. And that was definitely an issue that's come up in some of the workshops that I've been running for people living with HIV, um, many of whom are our peer advocates themselves. And it's a, a real theme about people just not making time for self-care. So all of you out there, make some time to look after yourself. So shall we bring on our first guest? Yes, let's do that. Our first guest is Joyce Uma. Hello. Hi, Hi Joyce. Hey, hey how, how are, are you? you? Very well. Thank you so much for joining us from Kenya. Thank you. Joyce, you've been doing absolutely tremendous work at Y Plus Global with young people. But can you tell us what can schools be doing to support young people living with HIV? Oh, well, uh, thank you very much for that question. It's, it's nice to start on that aspect. Um, as we know, schools continue to play a very key role in the lives of learners uh, living with, um, with HIV and, of course, learners in schools and all their diversity. But I have to admit that in as much as I'm trying to pick my brain to respond to this question, I don't think schools are doing so much um, or are doing enough to cater for the needs of young learners living with HIV in the education settings. I am saying this because I 
have been um, a young person living with HIV in the education setting in Kenya up to now. And I was also recently commissioned by Y Plus Global, which is also known as the Global Network of Young People Living with HIV, to um, lead the revision process of a publication known as Positive Learning, Meeting the Needs of Learners Living with HIV in Education Settings. And alongside um, a super amazing uh, co-consultant, Lynn Arrington, we were able to conduct certain um, consultations with young people and I'm going to give a response based on some of the feedback that we received from the young people. First I'd like to say that young people say they were still experiencing issues of mental health, um, stigma and discrimination, bullying and sometimes even violence in the school settings and Susan this is cross-cutting in six different regions. These were some of the cross-cutting issues that were coming up and this negatively affects their treatment and learning outcomes. However, we also know that schools can do more only if they are intentional or only if they want to do right by young people living with HIV. In our final tool, which is the result of the consultation and the feedback that we received from young people, we have collected the recommendations um, from them in seven key recommendations. We have um, the first focus area, which is on comprehensive sexuality education. We have confidentiality and sharing of um, information on one's HIV status. Um, we also have ending HIV-related stigma, discrimination, bullying, and violence. Um, HIV treatment and care, sexual and reproductive health and rights, mental health and psychosocial well-being creating an inclusive and health promoting environment. So all these focus areas, all these recommendations are briefly encompassed into the positive learning um, tool, the revised positive learning tool, which is now titled positive learning, how the education sector can meet the needs of learners living with HIV. Now, I know that there are many um, good um, documents that are already out there, but many a times we realize the schools mostly focus on HIV prevention, but they, they don't focus on the needs of learners um, living with HIV, such as the issues of treatment and care. And so schools need to be reminded to create a friendly and conducive environments for learners living with HIV to live fulfilling lives so as to promote education um, positive education outcomes. And finally, schools need to recognize and protect and support learners living with HIV in all their diversity. And that is the only other way that learners living with HIV can feel like they're part of part and parcel of the school environment. Thank you. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Did, 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 I mean, you, you talked about how the school schools need to create a better environment, not just about HIV prevention, but about HIV support, I guess. I mean, yeah. what was your personal experience of this? Uh, so 1st of July 2014, I remember that day so well because that is the day I got diagnosed with HIV. I was in my final year of secondary education in Kenya and I was like 17. And on that very day, I started becoming very sensitive around conversations uh, that involved HIV. And most of the conversations that were coming up were not um, really encouraging. Um, teachers could use HIV, people living with HIV as a bad example. So it goes back as that. Like if you, you know, um, getting HIV is a consequence of being sexually active. So if you don't want to be to get HIV, don't be sexually active. So such things really happen. And also, yeah, and I was only 17. <laughs> wow. And, 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 and I mean, so the teachers weren't being supported. Uh, are, are, do you find other students supportive generally of, of students living with HIV or is that a challenge? Uh, well, I think there's a thin line uh, between being supportive and being pitied. I gained a lot of friends out of pity and lost some also out of spite. Um, I wasn't sure at that time who was being real and who wasn't. But I must admit that I got some level of support from um, some of the of the students in the school and even some of the teachers. I was even put on a special diet, which I didn't appreciate at the time because it made me so obvious to everyone that then there is something wrong with me, you know. And, and mm -hmm. something else that really happened to me when I was in the school, um, I got um, I was a victim of faith healing. 
like someone who was allowed into the school to come and preach to me and say, you know what, um, you, if there's one of you in this crowd, he's living with HIV and you have been healed. I was only two days into my medication, still living in denial. I stopped taking medication. Yes. And then That's I realized, true. oh, my God, there is nothing like that. I was almost dying in the um, my final examinations are almost here. So, yeah, quite a memory. <laughs> but I'm glad I made it. Fantastic. And, and thank you so much for all of the such tremendous work that you're doing, Joyce. Thank you so much. It's really good to meet you. Thanks, Joyce. Wow. What a story. So, Susan, what have you been up to since since last September? <laughs> well, well, quite a bit um, over the last few uh, months. But um, last week, um, I attended the international workshop on women and HIV, and it was fantastic. There were so many really brilliant sessions but one particular session really stood out for me and it was a presentation by um, Bakita Cassida, um, a young researcher from Oxford University also living with HIV and, and she spoke about her research about um, infant feeding for women living with HIV and in the UK the advice is for women to exclusively formula feed, and I know that's quite different to other regions in the world, but women who want to be able to breastfeed should be supported to do so. And Bakita's research found that so many women weren't given this information and weren't given any support. And um, it, it, it was really shocking. And in some cases, they were actively discouraged from, from doing so. But um, From breastfeeding? from from breastfeeding so right. it just really highlighted the importance of people being informed but what was really fantastic about Bikita's session she actually won um young researcher for her presentation and that was so powerful particularly for so many black women living with HIV because very often we're just invited to conferences or to the media to sort of like share our story but not actually be involved as experts in our own right which so many of us actually are and you know despite experiencing intersecting forms of stigma and discrimination and disadvantage black women aren't these passive voiceless victims that we're somehow um presented as and and Bakita really blew out of the water that type of stereotype. So it was a really powerful moment. And I hope it's something that's going to continue at conferences and at all events. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and Bakita is such an impressive person. And we have had her on the show in the past. And I really hope we can get her back again because she always has just a really strong insight into what the, the the big topics are at the moment and it's interesting also that you know we're, we're talking about women and research and, and and there's a lot of stuff that's kind of coming out now because we're actually really looking at how women have been involved in research not just as uh, researchers themselves but also in in terms of like kind of what's their been their involvement in medical trials and their real gaps and it's it's, it's problematic it's very problematic um, let's get our next guest on. Our next guest is Juno Roche, acclaimed writer. Hi. Hi. Lovely to be here. Fantastic Absolutely you. wonderful to have you on from sunny Spain. Thank you. It is lovely and sunny, although it's, it's kind of getting evening here now, so the sun is going down slowly. It's freezing in London and my boiler's being repaired. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, trying not to shiver. <laughs> One Sorry, I'm bringing I... those energy bills down anyway, having a broken boiler. Mm -hmm. it, it kind of helps living under a socialist government. And then because the energy here is completely capped and I can't, I look at the stories from across there and I, I, I literally cannot believe it. I cannot believe the choices that are made. Still, I suppose we'll talk more about choices now. Absolutely. And so, do you know, a recent data analysis showed us you know, the, the, the extent that trans men and women and non-binary people are disproportionately affected by HIV. 
what would you say are the most important ways that we can actually meet the challenges that are faced? Honestly, uh, tackle uh, capitalism and patriarchy and racism and homophobia and transphobia. And what we've been doing for so long is to try and kind of politely skirt around the issue. And the issue is that the whole system itself and kind of marginalizes endless people. And um, and I think by marginalizing people, all you do is create gaps for people to fall into. And I think that part of the, you know, we've known for a long time that trans people are, are more at risk in any number of ways, like we've known, like we now know very clearly that uh, black women going in to have babies in the NHS are more at risk, like we know that back in the 80s that gay men were more at risk because people didn't care. I mean, until we start to tackle the big issues of a kind of capitalist society that creates, you know, I kind of think it's a really, it, 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 it's such a big thing. It's such a tough thing to kind of, to talk through that, um, you know, one thing that I'm really kind of like, um, that I found really interesting this past week was that they, the government only stopped conversion therapy for lesbians and gay men because there was such a big back backlash you know they weren't that the, there was kind of no one was kind of being centered in terms of that so i think that what we can do is to come together and we can fight the big issues we need to fight the big issues now because if we carry on fighting and imagining that somehow if we behave well at the edges that the system's going to change that the structures are going to change it's not going to you know, it's like, it's, you know, I'm kind of getting older and I'm realizing more and more that, you know, we've had endless reports about Grenfell, about trans people, about black women giving birth in the NHS, the NHS in which people are disproportionately impacted. You know, either we tackle the system and the structure that means that, and I'm not, this isn't, I'm not picking on white cis men. But unless we tackle the structure that allows white cis men like Boris Johnson and Donald Trump and endless leaders around the globe to rise to the top, unless we tackle that system head on, we are going to carry on nipping at the edges and people are going to release this. This must be the third or fourth study that I've seen that says that trans people are more at risk. The only really good thing about this study is that for the first time, it includes trans men. And they've been completely ignored in every way, shape or form. Uh, and, and that I think is a real, that's something that people need to kind of sit up. It's one of the things that I, for a long time have been saying that we need to think about the whole trans community. And, and by the way, when you look at the stats, and um, I know I need to keep it short, but like, <laughs> but when you look at the stats on that thing, it's really important to, to think that, although it says, I think it's something like 66, you're 66 times more likely to be, to, to have HIV or to, to be at risk from HIV if you're a trans woman. But I think we need to really drill down into that. If you're a black woman or a Latin woman living in North or South America, or parts of Asia, then, then you are at that 66% because you are dealing with any number of intersectional stuff. And I think it's really important to not co-opt that end of the data. For me as a, as a, as a white trans person, I think it's really important not to co-opt that data. And I think- that we um, I think well, one, of the, one of the things from that data is, is actually that data didn't include the UK. Um, and we only, we've only just started collecting sexual yeah. health data for yeah. trans people in the UK. And yeah. so the reporting we've got on it is still very far behind. I'll tell you something which really makes me excited is that we have a growing number of trans-led, trans-affirming sexual health services. We've got Clinic Q, we've got Clinic T, we've got 56T. And as a result of that, over half of the people who are kind of registered, categorized you know, in, in, the in the demographic group of being trans or non-binary who are attending clinics and who are HIV negative have, are, are on PrEP. 
which um, you know, I think it's, 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 it shows centering, when you center the people, the communities with the greatest need, and when you say, get on with it, you, you do this, you lead this, we can make a real change, because I think there's real hope that actually the UK will do better in transsexual health because of these services. Well, well, I mean, I, I mean, I think to a certain extent you're right, but I think that, but, but we're only we only have those services because we're doing so badly everywhere else. I mean, I, I mean, if I went to a GP in England to to see an endocrinologist as a trans person, I wouldn't be able to see one. There are none. I mean, there is there, there are very few people that can give me good uh, healthcare advice in the UK, and and certainly now with what's happening in the UK in relation to trans people and conversion therapy and the kind of new set of rules that are coming out from from the Equality and Human Rights Commission. I mean. I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a really positive thing. I agree with you, Matthew. I, I agree that I'm, I, I'm really heartened, having been, having been involved with many of those services over the years, I'm really heartened that they exist. But I'm also really aware that they all fight for funding every day. They fight to exist on, this, on the narrowest of budgets because people actually don't even, you know, if you look at the funding for the most at risk, it's the smallest amount of funding, and that's the way it's always been. If you look at the funding to work out, I remember giving a talk maybe five, six years ago now and saying, if you look at the, the, the trans people who are most at risk, less than 1% of the total age bu AIDS budget is dedicated to finding out why they're most at risk. So, I mean, I think those things we, we, sh we can't escape, we can't kind of walk away from those things. We have to the situation is perilous and 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 tough and and as much as i'd like to be on here and say that it's not that it is for trans people in the uk at the moment the, the situation is incredibly uh bleak and, and, and in the us i mean because so, so, as, 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 as you said it, it you know yeah. that well though the government has seems to have caved on lesbian gay bisexual conversion therapy as in they said they will bring forward a ban which they have actually promised what since 2017 i think it is um it was definitely theresa may was prime minister when they they, they promised they'd bring it in but um but they, they they they've said that they're not going to extend that ban to transgender people i think it's good that there's been gay bisexual and hiv health organizations have said right if you're not going to ban it for conversion therapy for trans people, we, we don't want to have any part of it. I think there has been quite a movement in the UK um, of LGB people saying we are LGBT and we will always stand with our trans comrades. Um, but what, what impact does this kind of exclusion or these terrible bills which are coming in in various US states, you know, don't say gay, don't talk about trans issues. I mean, what, what impact does that have on the mental health of trans people? I, I mean, I think it's, I mean, obviously I'm, I'm out of the UK at the moment, but I mean, I, I'm, I'm a trans, I don't have a, a, a gender recognition certificate. I don't have, I don't want one. I disagree with them fundamentally, politically and in, in every way. So, I mean, it, it's worrying because it means that if I come back, if I was in England, and I had to go into hospital, you know, with the stuff that uh, the health secretary said recently, which was about there being single sex wards and people being, you know, Boris Johnson talked about biological male. So he would, he would refer to me as being a biological male. And that's terrifying. Listen, I'm, I'm getting old, I'm, I'm tough, and I'm able, able to ignore an, a, 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 any number of things that people say. But I think if I was 17 and I was just starting out on my journey and I'm trying, I'm fighting for every last bit of safety and security. I'm a young person and I'm just leaving school and I'm 17 and I'm fighting and I want, and the help, the, the queue for services is kind of seven years long, the queue to get anywhere. And then the prime minister of your country is referring to you as being biologically male. And that opens the door for, for people that really want us to not exist. That opens the door for them to say, you know, we were right all along. These people are bad for society. 
And actually what I've always said is that trans people are actually being, we're really good for society. If we want a positive thing, it's that trans people are really good for society. They are challenging gender and breaking it down and reshaping it and making it easier for everyone. We're a really good thing and we mustn't lose sight of that. But it's really tough because if you think about <clears throat> how at risk someone with HIV is and now they've got this thing in their mind of like, I don't know if I can go to the hospital because will they refuse now to to accept me as being female or male or whatever it is that they want to, how they want to define themselves? Will they have to be seen as always being this biological thing? I mean, I think it's a terrifying thing. And I think that we just need to, we need to accept that the system is broken and the structure, the central core of it, any system that allows Boris Johnson, I'm really sorry, any system that allows Boris Johnson to become prime minister of a country is, is infinitely broken. And we need to think about what we do about that. A few years ago, people turned away Jeremy Corbyn because they thought that he was the, the worst thing that might ever happen. And we voted in Boris Johnson, who has done nothing but been, you know, racist and sexist and homophobic and transphobic, everything that you could possibly be. We need to tackle that. Thank you so much, Juno, for coming on and sharing your wonderful and important insights as always great to see you Thank juno's you. next book a working class family ages badly is out in july we'll be getting um, that we've got to I, i'm desperate to talk about our next guest it's dr tatiana kujenko who is coming to speaking to us from uh warsaw is that right uh, tatiana thank you so much for coming on i i'm so glad that you're safe in Poland, but could you tell us a little bit about your experience of having to leave your home in Ukraine? Thank you very much for inviting me to your chat. Uh, of course, um, I was uh, sad when I was leaving my home for a certain period and uh, my house, uh, my uh, husband uh, uh, is uh, stay in uh, my uh, uh, flat in Ukraine. And I, uh, I with my son uh, uh, now <laughs> in Warsaw uh, in Poland. Uh, uh, Professor Justyna Kowalska uh, helped us with uh, support and uh, with uh, flat. Uh, therefore, we are uh, feel very good uh, here. And uh, uh, my son uh, has started to, to go into school uh, to Warsaw and uh, uh, of course uh, in Poland I feel uh, better and safe than in Ukraine in this moment. Um, I believe you're, you're working on a helpline uh, for people from the Ukraine, people who have been displaced as a result of the Russian invasion uh, and who are living with HIV. What, what are the main concerns that you're hearing from the people you, 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 you work with on that? Uh, okay, so I uh, continue consulting people um, you know, living with HIV uh, through a free uh, online service. So we have uh, Ukrainian service help 24 uh, and a lot of uh, persons living with HIV are uh, uh, mm -hmm. forced to leave Ukraine and they are looking for a special treatment in Europe. and. Uh, ask about centers where they can take uh, antiretroviral treatment. And uh, it's very interesting and uh, for them that uh, in Europe, uh, other drugs than in Ukraine. Because uh, in Europe, uh, you have access to brand uh, uh, drugs from Viv, Healthcare, Gilead. In Ukraine, we have no access for these uh, regimens. Therefore, people uh, sometimes uh, uh, don't understand if they have uh, the same uh, regimen or not, and they uh, asked in uh, online consultations about this. And uh, I explained that in Europe, of course, they have access to the better uh, regimens than in Ukraine. Uh, sometimes uh, they can improve the regime of IRT. Uh, but um, 
uh, in addition with uh, EAX, uh, where I am uh, a member of governing board member of EAX International, not international, but European uh, Clinical Aid Society. So together with this organization and uh, network group uh, Euro guidelines in Central and Eastern Europe, we have initiated help uh, in order to support the needs uh, uh, both medical staff and patients in Ukraine and abroad. Uh, so we have a list of Eastern European clinics where patients from Ukraine can get uh, RT uh, available uh, and the clinics where uh, can admit uh, to proper hospital or uh, to uh, doctor uh, and uh, receive proper treatment. Also, humanitarian help uh, is available and uh, I personally send the box with humanitarian help from uh, uh, Poland to my clinic. I uh, work in Poltava Regional HIV Center and uh, uh, Prevention and Control of HIV and they received these uh, drugs. Uh, but uh, in Ukraine, supplement RT in Ukraine is supported by Ministry of Health and the NGO organization and founded not only government, by uh, PEPFAR, Global Fund. So in Ukraine, we have not problems with RT therapy at this moment. Of mm. course, some organizations have already had to scale back or stop their HIV programs because no respect for humanitarian corridors from Russian military. Uh, but I personally uh, communicated with, with my uh, best friend, doctor from the Parisia region, from Tokmak uh, city. It's uh, under full control of Russia at the moment, uh, but uh, they uh, have antiretroviral treatment from Ukraine and uh, patients uh, are continue to receive antiretroviral drugs without problem. So it depends uh, on region, I think. Okay. But, 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 but it seems that people, even in the occupied territories, are are still able to access their treatments. At the moment. Yes, if uh, because in this uh, ther territory, like in the Parisia region, um, they uh, occupied it in first days, so no fight on this territory. So it's uh, continue working. Uh, hospitals, but of course, like in Mariupol or uh, Chernihiv, where uh, hospitals were destroyed, of course, uh, patients are not available to receive any help in this region. In Kharkiv uh, region, uh, they continue work uh, working, but a lot of people from uh, Kharkiv um, uh, are in. Uh, now in Poltava, because Poltava is only fa uh, 100 kilometers uh, from Kharkiv, and a lot of uh, people uh, moved from Kharkiv to Poltava, so our regional center now is open too and working and uh, can propose a lot of treatment, for, not only for Poltava region people, but from Kharkiv and Sume too. Thank you so much for coming and, and sharing all of that with us, Tatiana. We really appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, and uh, just to say, uh, AIDSMAT has a page up now uh, for uh, people from Ukraine who are living with HIV, uh, to which gives us information about how to access medical services across Europe. Wonderful. Um, and also neighboring, neighboring countries. And that information is available in Russian and Ukrainian. Excellent. But oh my goodness, Matthew, we have run out of time. How has this happened? I don't um, know. We're out of practice. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to say a huge thank you to Joyce, Tatiana, and Juno for coming onto the show, to Theratech and Wandsworth Oasis for supporting. Um, this series of AIDS Map Chat. And all the crew at Disruptive, we will be back in two weeks' time. That's on the 25th of April. We have guests, including Professor Kevin Fenton, who is leading on England's HIV Action Plan. And we have the porn star and openly HIV positive activist, Caden Gray. Wonderful. Among other guests. 
Wonderful. So we will see you then. See you in two weeks. Bye. See you in two weeks. Bye.